If you love liberty, declare your independence by signing the Shire Society Declaration at ShireSociety.com. We're we'll open a hearing on House Bill 287, an act establishing a committee to study decriminalizing sex work. And we'll have the prime sponsor, Representative Elizabeth Edwards. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Elizabeth Edwards, and I represent Hillsborough District 11 in Manchester. HB 287 would create a study committee to examine the consequences of criminalizing prostitution and study alternatives. Uh, for a little bit of background, um, this is for the people who are new to this committee this year. Uh, I submitted HB 1614 in the 2016 session, um, which in the previous iteration of this committee heard that bill. Um, at their initial executive session, which I was able to record, uh, they voted refer for interim study. Uh, unfortunately, that paperwork did not reach the clerk's office somehow. And uh, when the committee voted again a couple weeks later, um, they recommended inexpedient to legislate. Uh, the House never voted on that motion, and the bill died on the table. So I decided to submit a less ambitious bill, a study committee bill, uh, partly in recognition of the committee's first decision. I was motivated to work on this issue in response to Amnesty International's August 2015 recommendation that governments across the world decriminalize sex work. Amnesty International studied the issue for two years prior to their recommendation. They conducted detailed research and looked at all aspects of the issue. Um, decriminalization of sex work is also supported by the World Health Organization, the International Labor Organization, the Global Alliance Against Trafficking in Women, the Global Commission on HIV and the Law, Human Rights Watch, and Anti-Slavery International. Currently, law enforcement and justice system resources are being consumed prosecuting interactions between consenting adults. Uh, prohibition on prostitution pushes sex workers into the margins of society where they can't report crimes against them. Uh, it pushes sex workers onto the street because they have to be constantly mobile so that they don't get caught. This black market <coughs> empowers pimps and traffickers. When a person is arrested for prostitution, faces all over the local news, even if charges are dropped, the combination of news coverage and an arrest record makes it more difficult if she wants to get employment in a different field. The negative consequences multiply at every tier of the punitive justice system. This study committee would take a serious look at all of those costs. Uh, under decriminalization, such as in New Zealand and like Rhode Island had for several years, sex workers can organize for their rights. They gain access to the justice system. They're in a better position to insist on safety precautions and screening clients and wearing condoms. They can do their work indoors and install locks and cameras and hire security guards. The best data we have on what decriminalization could look like in New England comes from Rhode Island. You know, it's difficult to disentangle correlation and causation, but fortunately, there was this strange thing that happened in Rhode Island where a court decision in 2003 found that the Rhode Island legislature had inadvertently decriminalized indoor prostitution. So it's kind of like a natural experiment. In the six years that followed, incidents of rape dropped by 31% and the transmission rate of sexually transmitted infections dropped by 39%, not just among sex workers, but across the entire state's population. This is extremely strong evidence that decriminalization 
makes all of us safer from violence and disease. We have an obligation to examine this evidence, and a study committee will permit that to happen. We have a responsibility to make decisions based on the consequences of legislation, not on the intentions. Now is the time to face the consequences of the current legal regime. There are better options on the table that respect human rights and promote public health and safety. I'm happy to take any questions, and I also have a subject matter expert um, who is also going to testify. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for taking my question. Do you cite where you get your secondary uh, statistics from to support the drawing? Yeah, okay. I have Thank all you. that. And you'll be giving that to us? Yes. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for taking my question. Could you tell me, do you have the history on why Rhode Island revealed their law? There's, I, I um, Bella is actually from Rhode Island and was there at the time, so she'd be able to speak to that. Um, you know, I don't think that people uh, think clearly very often when it comes to issues like prostitution. There's um, a lot of fear, a lot of um, moralizing, and you know sometimes um, it sometimes uh, <coughs> progress takes a step a step backward, and I think that's what happened in two thousand nine. Thank you. <coughs> Wallace. Wallace, I'm sorry, I haven't Is called on you before. That's fine. <laughs> Is there any uh, background information on the potential uh, tax impact um, of going above ground with the trade and the income tax and reporting uh, and, you know, that would be beneficial, I would think? Now, a study committee like this bill would make would definitely, uh, it, could, it could take a look at legalization and regulation, which would, you know, potentially have um, tax benefits to the state but um, I'm not uh, personally I'm not an advocate of uh, legalizing and regulate because it creates um, two, two tiers of sex workers it creates a legal market and a black market like in uh, Nevada the there is still a black market um, and the most disadvantaged sex workers are still without all of the resources um, that decrim would allow them to access. Um, they're still brutalized. And so uh, sex workers are more than capable of organizing. There are unions in other countries where they, um, you know, they, they, they want to educate each other. They want to look out for each other. So, but this bill, of course, could, you know, the study committee could look at those options, definitely. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the question. We're talking adults. Oh, Is yeah. that correct? Yes, just adults. And a follow-up? Yes. And at no time, you know, whether it be children or anything else, it's just between two consenting <coughs> adults, just like if my wife and I want to go out to dinner, on who's going to pay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. And in fact, you bring up um, minors in the sex trade, and decrim makes it easier to find and identify trafficking victims. Um, right now, if a sex worker suspects that somebody is not is that somebody is underage or that they're being trafficked, they can't go to the police because they will be arrested, sometimes assaulted by police officers. It does happen. Um, so this action, so decrim has been found to create a cooperative relationship between law enforcement and sex workers. Um, it would actually help protect those people. Thank you. Do you know how many individuals are arrested for prostitution in Yes, I do have those statistics. <laughs> and, you know, and you know how many people are in the women's prison who have been with their left? I don't think we have the, that second um, 
fact, but we do have the number of arrests going back 30, 30 years. years, so you can examine trends. Does it also include the uh, the uh, prosecutors, but whoever they're they're doing business with, to clients? Uh, yes. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Representative, do you have statistics on how many women volunteered to get into sex work or were hooked on drugs by someone to get them involved? In prostitution. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's, are some obviously. One of the disadvantages of a black market is that it's very difficult to contact these women. They're afraid. They do not want to be identified. So, um, but we do have statistics. They're kind of fuzzy, but we do have statistics on how many women choose go begin sex work as um, of their own free choice and how many are um, brought into it by somebody else. Tell me you're coerced. Thank you. No further questions. Thank you very much for your testimony. Kate Murray. You are listed as a co-sponsor, but you're opposing the bill. Yes, sir. Thank you all for taking me here instead of there. It's all a new experience. I feel a little bit like Representative Schmidt yesterday who was sponsoring a bill that he didn't know how he felt about one way or the other, but felt it should be a conversation. I'm kind of in that same situation. I co-sponsored this partly because I think there was a conversation to be had, and it's a conversation that's interesting for this group, but I don't support this bill in its present state. I don't support legalization of prostitution. I think that a broad discussion, a general discussion of decriminalization is a slippery, an unpalatable slope. I don't support that. I also believe that as an educator and as a researcher, broad-based studies such as is presented here really don't present anything towards the issue. There's no work towards the issue. Instead, they become a platform for a single point of view, but there's not a focus of an issue and where you end up finding evidence that support the view you already have. To me, that's not a study. So you can ask, why am I doing this? I have an opportunistic bent as well as an optimistic bent. And I see possibilities in the nature of a study like this that looks at a specific lens with regards to a specific group of people. A lens where there is common ground and where we have agreement about a problem to tackle. The lens that I'm looking at is the trafficking of human beings in the sex trade. My written remarks give more information uh, specifics about this, but there are some things I want to speak here. Um, we know that the, someone who is involved in uh, human trafficking is victimized by the trafficker. Also within the system, there's a potential for this individual to be victimized by the criminal justice system as well, being identified too late as a victim of the trafficker. A law enforcement agent may make an arrest and find out later that this individual is more victim than criminal, but the justice system takes its course and it's difficult to go in another direction for those individuals. And indeed, a law enforcement official may feel that in this context and the current situation, the best situation for that individual is to is imprisonment. So we all have common ground, I think, around human trafficking and thinking it's a real bad idea to a heinous problem. And I think people can understand how one can be a victim treated as a criminal. There are safe harbor laws uh, mentioned in the paper, but often they don't work, and the question of the study is why. This committee has the ability to focus on to focus the emphasis on a study. This may be going too far, may be asking too much, uh, but I'm new, so I'm willing to go down that path and take the risk. So I asked the committee to consider doing a, consider putting a lens on this with regards to trafficking, a topic that we would ignore, but a crime that extends beyond the borders of this country and exists in every state in this country. The 95 corridor is a well-known and unfortunately frequently used corridor with regards to trafficking. I ran into the ubiquity of this crime when I was looking at a, trying to find background on a particular case in Portsmouth. Uh, there was a Chinese woman who was held against her will and she was not treated as a criminal. Um, she was freed basically as a victim. But I was curious to find the outcome of this. So I went online, sequenced online to see what I could find with regards to this. And I put in the words you would expect of Asian, woman, victim, sex trafficking. I didn't find anything of these articles about that. 
but a banner popped up on my screen advertising that very crime. One sex with Chinese, young Chinese girl registered here. That I could find. An actual study, a real study, a study that I could support, does specific things. It has a goal, and here we're looking at a more refined way of identifying victims. We make mistakes. Why do we make mistakes? What can we do about that? <coughs> a study also has a proposed path to social services as opposed to prison. These are uh, actions that might be suggested as alternatives to what these victims face now. Also, the cost of the program would be a consideration because you cannot presume one without the other. I consider myself an advocate for victims, which is why, as opposed to the broadness of decriminalization, there is an opportunity to talk about a specific area where we can recognize easily that there are victims. And it's difficult within a broad spectrum to discern who's a victim and who's not a victim. So we focus on the trafficking. Pope Francis says why I would feel this way as an advocate. There can never be true peace as long as a single human being is violated in his or her personal identity. Human trafficking crushes identity. So where I cannot support a broad study around the general concept of decriminalization, I could support a study that focuses its emphasis on individuals that we already recognize as victims, the victims of human trafficking, who often become victims of the justice system because they're criminalized to be forced to commit crime and prostitution. So that is my perspective. And I'm glad to take questions, or we can all, I guess, we'll have a chance to discuss this later anyway. I guess we will. <laughs> Isn't it possible that not all sex workers are victims? Yes. And I said, but I, my focus is specifically on the ones who are and who have no voice. Any further questions? <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your testimony. Um, I understand where your thoughts are with trafficking and you know the, the real victims. I see this bill as helping those victims by decrimming something that has already happened. And if they want, they do not want to be in there. Then you know maybe this study would help. How do we stop that? You know how how do we assist them? But the ones that want to be there, which there are many men and women that want to be in this profession, how do we also protect them by giving them you know, more rights so they aren't being arrested every time they step out on the street corner, which you know, I think that would stop also if this was legal. I understand your point of view. Um, I think that we could have a discussion about what constitutes victimization. Um, I think my specific concern here is that there is a group of people who have no voice and who are clearly victims around this trafficking issue. In terms of Representative Saparetta's and your concern, to me that's another issue, um, it's a broader issue, and I don't think that a study that's this broad can contain all the different elements that go into this. Uh, I'm just uncomfortable with the breadth of it, uh, with the assumptions that, you know, indeed there are people who choose to work in the sex industry, um, but I don't see how it accounting for those who don't. Thank you. Further questions? Seeing none. Oh, oh, oh. Sorry. Um, you know, we have, thank you for your question, questions, we have the ability when this committee to amend any piece of what this legislation, including this, have you considered taking the your vision to what an appropriate committee would be and bringing an amendment to the committee? Um, yes, I've given it some thought, but being new, not probably enough or a whole lot. Um, and I don't know if this goes beyond the scope of what this committee can do. I know that we can have some uh, influence in adjusting things, but I don't know is if, if this is if this goes too far. Well, it's our, it's, it's no longer, it's, it's our, the committee's bill. We can do whatever we want with, I know, we would, be, would, but that's just something you should know. If you want to do that, I would help you uh, think about putting together the Thank you. I will be glad for the help. I, I, have, I have to apologize to Representative Wallace. I've been cataracts. I can't read your name. And you are no member, so I will try hard not to make that mistake again. And the same goes for you, by the way. Yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. Representative uh, Suzanne Harvey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, committee members. 
um, Suzanne Harvey representing Ward 2 in uh, Marshall. And uh, I'm speaking in favor of the bill. I'm going to be real quick because I have to get back to the meeting. But um, I'm in favor of it because I think as much as we can have a public discussion about human trafficking, the better. And it's my understanding that um, probably, it's my guess, the majority of sex workers are being trafficked or were to, to start with. Um, and many of them are um, addicted to substances. So let me just give you a little background. Um, several years ago, maybe in 07 or 08, um, I chaired the commission here on human trafficking. And out of that commission came a pretty big report. You can find it on the website of the New Hampshire Coalition Against Domestic and Sexual Violence. Um, <coughs> and out of that report came a recommendation for legislation. So the next year, I was the prime sponsor of the legislation that made human trafficking a felony in the state of New Hampshire. Since then, I've been involved in a statewide task force, which has been in um, in existence for several years now, um, and has gone through a couple of iterations um, on human trafficking, and it's still going strong. Uh, as a matter of fact, we have New Hampshire won, this group won a, um, an award from the Department of Justice to do its work statewide. Uh, so I just want to make, wanted to be part of this to tell you how important it is to understand that so many sex workers are forced into it through a human trafficking situation. Whether they started as minors and then stayed in it as adults or came into it as an adult. And I think uh, the one thing I might add, if there is going to be any kind of amendment, is, and I, I don't know, I'm sorry, I missed part of the initial um, talk from the time sponsor. I don't know if she mentioned anything about Johns. And I think the discussion about Johns and criminalizing that, I, I don't even know if that's in the current statute or not, but making that kind of a, um, a focus, because if, if we really treat paying for sex as a crime, um, then it could act as um, reducing demand. And that's always been true. So um, I would like to see that be part of the discussion if we do have uh, a study commission. Uh, study committee. So that's what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Representative Tetzelman has a question. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Representative, uh, you mentioned something interesting. Uh, a study was done by a, uh, a group. Uh, and then from that legislation was put forward that you sponsored. Could this just as well be done by the Coalition Against Violence for Women uh, rather than, than have the government set up a, a study? Thank you for the question. I think that um, if it's done here as a commission, you know, the difference between a commission and a study committee is as a commission you can really have around the table with voting rights um, the main stakeholders. So you really broaden your discussion. And, um, and out of their report will come either a recommendation for further legislation or not. And that carries some weight. If that commission says, let's have some legislation, that carries some weight. More weight than if it was done outside. Um, that's how I would answer that. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you for taking my question. Could you tell us what the difference between prostitution and trafficking is, or are they the same? Well, if someone's being trafficked, um, there's the force, coercion fraud. and fraud are involved. Um, not necessarily any of those if you are a voluntary sex worker. So 
Do you want more? No, that's okay. okay. Are you aware of any other studies that on uh, this before our previous bills, to your knowledge? On constitution? A study bill on this uh, study of the sex. Not that I remember. Not my time. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. Okay, we you. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Patricia Conway. I'm the Rockingham County Attorney. Thank you for, for taking the time to listen to me today about this important issue. Um, I'm here because I'm against um, this bill, and I'm also here to, to give you some information regarding a perspective from someone who's been a prosecutor for 20 years um, and from someone who has prosecuted. Um, human trafficking cases and from someone who has sat down and interviewed and spoken with um, victims of human trafficking. Um, you know, with all due respect to some of the people that have already spoken here today, I, I don't really, for me, it's hard for me to wrap my brain around uh, respecting human rights and legalizing prostitution in the same sentence. Um, it, that just blows my mind. Consenting adults, I, I want you to understand that the folks that I have spoken to, and, and I'm not going to pretend to be a, an expert on this, I'm not, um, but the, the victims that I have spoken to regarding uh, human trafficking, they're not consenting adults. Uh, many times we see kids do this. In fact, I had a victim who was 16 years old. She was a runaway. Um, she was a victim of sexual abuse. Her father sexually abused her, um, allegedly. Mom uh, chose to believe the, fa the boyfriend over her daughter, and basically DCYF took this girl out of her home, put her in foster care, and she continuously ran away. She had nowhere to go. She didn't feel like she could go home. She didn't feel like she was supported anywhere, and she ended up <coughs> falling into the hands of this pimp. She had nowhere to go. She had no money. She had no place to live. She couldn't take a shower. This is not a consenting adult. And on the outside, when you talk to this, when I talked to this young girl, she tried to convince me that it was okay and that she was consenting to this. But as an adult, and as a professional in this area, I could see that she was being coerced because she had nowhere else to go. I've also dealt with victims of human trafficking who are severely addicted to opiates. Um, and this was a case in Portsmouth, and the defendant was convicted of a human trafficking offense. He's now in state prison. But it involved four women who were adults. They were over 18. Um, three of them su suffered from substance abuse disorder, um, and he controlled access to heroin. They stayed in a hotel with him. They traveled with him. They were not allowed to get heroin from any other source. And if they did not perform those sexual acts, then they wouldn't get heroin. And they would become dope sick to the point where they thought that they were going to die. Now, did they say, yes, I'm going to do this so I can get the heroin? Yeah. <clears throat> but is that really cons a consenting adult, or is that someone who's being coerced? And under the statute, it's someone who's being coerced. But again, if you talk to these women, they'll, they, they will tell you, they will look you right in the eye and tell you that they consented to do this. But is that the kind of thing that we want to allow to happen in our state? Is that respecting human rights? I, I would suggest that, that it's not. Um, I've also had a victim who was in a domestic violence situation. Um, and it was confirmed because there are convictions on this person's record, her boyfriend. And he had assaulted her again. She was afraid for her life. She met this guy who, who ended up being a pimp at her girlfriend's house at a party. And she was afraid. She didn't want to go back home, so she ended up going with him. 
Uh, this is the same individual I talked about who was supplying heroin to three other women. Said he would protect her, make sure she was safe. Again, is this someone who's consenting or is this someone who is being coerced due to whatever circumstances they're, you know, they're in at, at the moment? And so he took her to a hotel, he wouldn't let her leave, he took her cell phone, he took her um, purse, so any access she had to money, she didn't have her purse, she didn't have any credit cards, nothing. And then he started giving her heroin. Why? Because he wanted to get her addicted to the drug so he would have even more control over her. So those, those are the types of victims that I have seen over the last few years in human trafficking. It's all, also my belief that decriminalizing prostitution, it, it's not, I don't see how it is going to prevent um, or how it's going to help victims of human, human trafficking come forward and report what's going on. Regardless of whether or not it's, it's legal or illegal, if we have a pimp who's, who's threatening or using violence or using things like heroin to control people, they're not going to come forward. They're not going to come forward for the same reasons. They're afraid they're not going to get their drugs. They're afraid they're going to get hurt. They're afraid he's going to tell their loved ones about what's going on. So we're, gonna, we're still going to have the same issue. I also think that decriminalizing prostitution will fuel our current drug epidemic. I, I just told you about instances where pimps are using that to control and compel women, and I'm sure men in some circumstances, to, to do this. In my mind, in my opinion, I, I don't believe decriminalization is the answer. I, I don't think we want to live in a state where prostitution is legal. And that's, that's, that's my personal opinion. I also think that with prostitution, we're going to see, you know, and we do see it now, and I don't think legalizing it is going to stop it. We're going to see more drugs. Whenever we have a case where prostitution is involved, we always see drugs in the room. Always, almost always. So I think it will bring more drugs in our state. I think it will bring more crime in our state. So that's all I have. Um, also, I just wanted to point out that with regard to prostitution now, we're all, we're all concerned about victims of human trafficking, right? So if someone commits a crime of prostitution and they're a victim, that's actually an affirmative defense that's in the statute right now. So there are, there are protections there for, for victims of human trafficking. So if someone char is charged with prostitution and they really are a victim, then that's an affirmative defense. So there is some protection there for victims. Right. Now, this bill is to create a study. Right. And uh, so far, almost except for the original testimony, there's been really no testimony about the study. But, uh, you know, I, I let you go on because that's an important part of our process. Uh, well, I'm just, I'm just trying to give you some personal experience that I've had um, with the situation in real life, in um, cases and circumstances. Assistant Attorney, would you be willing to serve on the study commission? Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I, I may have two questions here, but you talked about this 16 year old. Um, well, Reverend Bert, this is the bill is about a study. Yeah, well, that's what my point was. Was. But they're talking about a 15-year-old, and that's a, a, that's a different subject matter. It, it is. But, so you know, we but, shouldn't talk about it. Well, all she covered was on the 16-year-old, but what I was just getting to is that wouldn't this study committee help and identify these issues and possibly, you know, resolutions to it? I think it, it could identify, we could, we could maybe more positively identify who victims of human trafficking are, which is a good thing. Yeah. But, but I don't think that decriminalization and prostitution is the answer. 
That's my point. And I, I also want to point out that people who commit human trafficking don't care how old the victim is, and they're not going to ask any questions. If that person to them looks like they're 18 or older, they, they, they don't care. They're not going to ask. Even if they have a suspicion, they're not going to ask. Um, so the person might be a child, but the, the person who's committing the human trafficking might hold that person out as being an adult. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Now, I presume that you don't prosecute people who are put in prostitution cases where there's forced coercion or fraud, right? No. But in other cases, but there are cases where a prostitution that you a prostitution that you do prosecute, right? No, I don't. Pro Prostitution primarily is a misdemeanor. The county attorney's office doesn't get involved if, unless it's a felony. So if, if someone is under 18, if it's a child, or if it involves coercion or force, that kind of thing, then we would get involved and prosecute it. Um, so we don't prosecute the misdemeanor offenses. I also want to point out real quick, you just brought something up that I wanted to talk about as well. Sometimes, being able to, law enforcement is able to get their foot in the door and speak to victims of human trafficking by charging them. And I know that may sound terrible, but there are many circumstances where they will not come forward. And if we charge them initially and say, look, you know, we believe you're a victim, or if you just, you know, be honest with us, you know, we'll see what we can do for you and we can interview the person and, and work with them. And sometimes it's, it's the only way for us to sort of get our foot in the door and start investigating these cases. So in some ways, I, I think, again, keeping prostitution um, illegal helps us identify and prosecute human trafficking cases. Uh, um, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, how, this bill is, you're, you've been giving testimony that a study committee would normally provide, would ask for it, and all, most of the testimony, other than the prime sponsors, was something the study committee would hear. Yeah. It's designed to give information to the legislature to make informed decisions. How is keeping them ignorant, not having them informed decisions, help your position? Um, I'm not suggesting that, that people should, you know, should sort of be a blind eye and, and act ignorantly on different issues. But what I'm suggesting is that I've been involved in this for a number of years. And after speaking with uh, victims of human trafficking, I, I don't under, I don't believe that decriminalizing prostitution is the that's answer to the issue. <laughs> and that's, my understanding is that the bill is for a study to look at whether or not we should decriminalize prostitution. And I'm against that. Do you have a question? Oh, yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Do you think it's like a committee like this could benefit in the long run by not legalizing prostitution, but being able to take the victims and set them into a study and rehab them, and maybe even uh, get more evidence on prostitu uh, on uh, pimps. Sure. I mean, I think that that could be helpful. Yes. Thank you. Any further questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Now we're up against the time. Well, we're supposed to uh, uh, set a hearing on House Bill 94, and I still have a handful of cards here, and, but I don't have a sponsor for House Bill 94. Is there one in the room? Then oh. I would ask. Oh, I'm. Sponsor. Sponsor. I'm talking about. But What's that? A sponsor. Yeah. A sponsor. And the sponsor. The sponsor. Looking for the Somebody sponsor. Did you do for House Bill 94? Correct. Oh, okay. I was just up there. I was mistaken. I guess I'm one going to happen. So in the absence of a sponsor, perhaps, uh, do we have one? No. No, I was going to suggest it. Open 94. Can I introduce it? Yeah. Would you introduce the bill and then I'll recess it? I guess it is. Okay. No, I just spoke to him a second ago. I told him it was a winner Well, he's not here. And right now we're past the time. It's at 11. So I appreciate your, your help. But Mr. Chairman, uh, there's a hearing open already. Don't we need to close that before we open another one? 
I'm trying to determine whether or not we're going to recess this or keep it going. All right. I'm just asking the question. We don't have a sponsor. Yep. Mr. Chairman, I will introduce it. All right, then. We're, right now, we will recess the uh, House Bill 287. Until when? Pardon? Two seconds. 30 oh, seconds. Okay. About that, yeah. We're going to just open the next okay. bill and then recess it, and then we will continue with it. <laughs> Representative uh, Bolden. <laughs> you are the report of 287. Oh, that's right. Thanks for the century flower for a couple minutes. Um, when I decided to speak, it was before the chairman um, pointed out so rightly that the um, that this is just a conversation. We're proposing having a conversation, and this is the place in New Hampshire where we have these conversations. Um, and that's why this matters. Um, and it was stated earlier that decriminalization and legalization, legalization are not the answer. Well, what's the question? The question is not if we want to do that. The question is, should we have a conversation? And um, it seems intellectually dishonest, rigid, and um, immature to even refuse to have a conversation. And I'm not saying that every study committee is a fabulous idea, um, but I certainly think this one is, and that's why I co-sponsored um, and the idea that that if, if such a study committee resulted in some change in law the idea that it would fuel the drug epidemic is I think laughable because um, it's pretty well established that drugs are easier to access inside of New Hampshire jails and prisons than they are on the outside um, there was a homeless man in Manchester named Jeffrey Pendleton who was arrested for having marijuana joint um, he went to jail and three days in died of a fentanyl overdose. It doesn't take three days to die of a fentanyl overdose. It takes, you know, ten minutes. Um, so he got fentanyl inside of the Valley Street Jail down the road from my house. Um, so if we don't want people, um, if we don't want uh, people arrested for um, sex work to have access to drugs, maybe better not to put them in the Valley Street Jail. Um, and the idea that legalization would encourage violence um, or that um, that it would encourage drug use, I think is odd because it's those problems that this, it's the fact that it's illegal that discourages anyone from going to police if they're being raped, if they're being trafficked, if they're being um, beaten um, and, and abused, if they're being um, taken advantage of with drugs. Um, the last thing they want to do is go to a police officer and, and say this is the situation and, and end up arrested for committing the crime of prostitution um, because it's not the kind of help that they're looking for. And, you know, as a point of reference, in New Hampshire we have a law right now that if someone calls 911 to report a drug overdose, then the person calling 911 and the victim of the drug overdose, the patient, are both immune from prosecution for um, the charge of possession. And so there's certainly a lot of situations in New Hampshire where someone might be doing something wrong, but if they need help, we'd rather help them than arrest them. Um, so I think that that's really what a conversation about this um, might involve. If we were to allow a conversation, um, we might uh, realize that in some situations it's better to extend help to someone, to help them move out of a situation that's damaging them, than to put them in the Valley Street Jail so they can overdose on fentanyl. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for taking my question. Could you tell me where the idea came from for you to introduce this bill? Or the two of you introduce it? Thanks for your question. Elizabeth asked me, I said yes. I generally just say yes to whatever Elizabeth asks. I think she's pretty <laughs> That is not true. <laughs> I just would like this second question. I've been around here a long time, and I have never had anyone ever asked me to introduce a sex bill, either a committee or a study. And I just don't under, we had this last year, mm -hmm. and it's up again this year. I just don't understand where it's coming from. Is it somebody you know? Or, yeah, someone you know? Elizabeth, it's my turn to talk. I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Thank you. Did you 
Would you like to let me? Yeah. <laughs> no, it's okay. I'm just. Oh, we're okay. Well, I mean, I just think it's common. I'm the, I'm the instigator here. I think that sex workers are human beings, and they're swept under the rug and ignored and brutalized, and it's time to stop that. If you recall, Representative, in the last session, we had a couple of bills involved in them. We had some right. of the sex workers in here. Right. I, I just, um, may I continue? I just think this is a profession that most women choose on their own. I hate to make any laws that gives it the right to pimps to take young children and make them into prostitutes, mm -hmm. and they can't get back out. That's my view. Thanks, thanks for your comment. Um, the, the, I, doubt, I highly doubt that a conversation, a study about this uh, subject would result in um, the passage of a law that would allow um, adults to sell children into sex slavery. I really, if you guys don't even want to have a study sure. committee about this, then that's never going to happen. No. So that's not a real risk from studying this, if we even got that far. Um, so we don't need to worry about that. But um, I think it, it deserves to be um, reiterated that whether or not someone voluntarily does something um, is beside the point. If someone's doing something and and they're raped or beaten, um, horrible things, they're bleeding, whatever, and they think in their minds, I can't ask for help because if I ask for help, I'll be arrested. Is that an outcome that we want in New Hampshire for women? Do we want women who are raped and beaten to accept their situation and just live with it? I think that's how people end up in a trafficking situation is when they consent to, a, they consent to sex they are abused, and they don't have a way out. They can't ask for help because, in their minds, it might be worse to be arrested. And we don't—we're not here to determine why someone might choose one outcome over another. Why they might choose to continue to be abused rather than report the abuser to the police. But if that's what we're getting from the current law, then it's worth a conversation about how we might rearrange the laws to encourage women to actually report their abusers even if they've done the most terrible thing in the world of deciding to have sex for money. That's their business, not ours. I, I agree. Great. Right. And if they're victims, that is our business. That's the entire purpose of this building. We're going to have to cease having conversations without Excuse asking me. for the question. I apologize. It's all right. I see no further questions. Thank you very Thank much. You. Uh, Peter Ma. Sign up as well, we're just going to come on the Save you guys some time. Don't drop your gun, please. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for your time. And uh, my name is Peter Marr. I'm a detective sergeant in charge of the domestic sexual violence unit in the Manchester Police Department. This is my boss, Lieutenant uh, Nicole Ledoux. Uh, and we're here in opposition to House Bill 287. Um, the, reasons I'm, the reasons for that um, are many, and I think even having established a study to, uh, to discuss it is uh, based on little information and um, is a, a waste of time, to be honest with you. Um, de decriminalizing prostitution is not going to solve anything. Um, there are several arguments for it. Uh, you heard some of them today. Uh, some of it would be that uh, it would make it safer for prostitutes and they won't have to rely on uh, a pimp to set up their transactions or vet johns. Uh, that it'll stop sex trafficking because once it's no longer illegal, then the trafficking will stop. Um, neither of these arguments hold any, any truth at all. Uh, de decriminalizing prostitution will create a haven for traffickers. Uh, it will actually draw them into our communities uh, rather than keep them out. Sets and human trafficking are extremely tough cases from a law, law enforcement uh, perspective. The victims are economically um, dependent, drug dependent, psychologically they're dependent, and most, um, lots of times they're emotionally dependent on the traffickers. 
the fact that prostitution is illegal um, gives law enforcement the leverage to detain Johns. It gives us leverage to actually conduct investigations. Without that leverage, there's really no reason for them to talk to us at all and provide us any information whatsoever uh, in human trafficking case. Officer, my yes. Bear in mind that this is a uh, established a committee to study the subject matter. And uh, the testimony that you're giving is probably more to the following. Though. Uh, I would argue that the testimony we're giving is to show you why you shouldn't even establish a committee to study it. We have a law that we feel is effective. We use that law in investigation in human trafficking cases. We do not prosecute victims in human trafficking cases. We cannot simply arrest someone because they tell us they're a prostitute. It's a misdemeanor level offense and it has to occur in our presence for us to make an arrest. The women that you see arrested for prostitution are normally arrested in stings where a police officer has been involved in some sort of transaction with them and they are arrested in the sting. When we arrest prostitutes in the city of Manchester, I speak only, we sit down with every single one of them and find out if they are in fact a trafficking victim. If they are, we get them services. We are not in the business of prosecuting victims. So I think the arguments that we're putting forward are to show you that we have an effective law right now that we use to help trafficking victims, that we <coughs> use to prosecute those who would purchase other people for sex, and that Start study a, having a study committee to de decriminalize prostitution is a waste of your time. If you want to have a study committee to understand how to better help human trafficking victims, we're all for that, 100%. Because there are victims of human trafficking. I have sat down, Sergeant Marr has sat down with women who are involved in prostitution. I have never once had one woman in the 21 years that I've been involved in law enforcement tell me that they got involved in prostitution because it was a viable professional opportunity for them to make money. Every one of them has either been a drug addict, an abuse victim, or economically dependent on prostitution to survive because they're homeless. This is not a profession that women wake up in the morning and say, you know what, I think it'd be a great idea to sell, myself for, uh, sell my sex for money today because there's really no other way to make a living. So I think the arguments that uh, everyone that's been in opposition are trying to make is there's no sense in having a study committee. The laws are effective. We're not prosecuting victims. We need those laws to arrest those who would buy people for sex. We need those laws to help us in our investigations of human trafficking. And we're absolutely 100% on board if you want to have a commission to study how to help human trafficking victims because we're in that business as well. Thank you very much for that. And I apologize. No, absolutely. Because we get to the nub of it. That's good. Absolutely. Are there any questions? Dr. Bird has a question. Thank you for your testimony, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, to the gentleman, he said that it was a waste of time. So, are you saying educating lawmakers is a waste of time? No, having a discussion to legalize or decriminalize prostitution, I believe is a waste of time. And a follow-up? Yes. But what I see in this study, and I was hoping that you would explain, you know, your side, is this would educate the lawmakers on if we should even look at uh, legalizing prostitution or <clears throat> what can we do if it is truly, as you say, which I disagree, that it's 100% victims that are prostitutes? You know, it would give the lawmakers an open door to this society that we're forbidden to look at to change laws, uh, according to you. You would not like, you know, not want us to do that. What was your question, sir? It, do you think we should not look at this because we may see avenues that we could help these victims and also separate the women that, and men that really want to be there and separate them from the victims that we could help? That's where I see this going. That we could separate the two and it wouldn't be a waste of time to educate us in understanding that there are two groups of people in this profession. There's the victims and there's the people that want to be there. 
How do we help both sides? Well, my understanding is that the study is to decriminalize prostitution, not to learn about victims. That's the word. That's what the title says. That's right. Establishing a committee to study decriminalizing sex work. And if I may follow up on that, Mr. Chairman? Yes. But at the end, we could say, no, it's a bad idea. We're not going to do it. But we may learn something in the process of helping these truly, truly victims. Sir, I would argue that if, if that's truly your intent, um, I would be more than happy to discuss that with you. The coalition would be more than happy to discuss that with you. Um, but as a committee, I believe, and as a taxpayer in the state, I believe it's a, it's a waste of time. Question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You had said that you would not be against a study of sex work. No. The word decriminalization is what is bothering you a great deal. The study that what we have in front of us is a study to decriminalize Correct. prostitution. You want to do a study on sex work and how you can help people who are victims. Right? Okay, so you say there are people that are voluntarily involved. I believe, yes, of course, somewhere in the world, there are people that are voluntarily involved. But if you want to study how to help victims, we're in the same business. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Thank you very much for your testimony. Bella Robinson. In support. Yes, I am. Thank you, Mr. Chair and the committee. Um, and, uh, my name is Bella Robinson, and I'm the executive director of the Rhode Island chapter at Coyote. We are a group of sex workers, former sex workers, trafficking victims, and survivors, and we kind of use the brain people involved in the sex industry. And I have to say that I, um, I hear so much about victims, and they claim victims have no voices, but what I heard from almost everyone today, that unless you're a victim, you don't matter, what you have to say doesn't matter, your safety, protection, and health doesn't matter, because only the victims count. And I wanted to answer your question about how Rhode Island decriminalized prostitution. It was actually through Coyote versus Roberts, which was a constitutional challenge. All prostitution used to be a felony in the 70s, and what happened is the case was dismissed due to a compromise that the legislatures were willing to make public prostitution a misdemeanor, and it left a loophole for indoor sex work that no one really noticed until um, around the 90s, almost close to 2000. We've also filed a constitutional challenge that's now in the Ninth District Court of Appeals called Esbrook versus Jason. This is much like homosexuality laws. The state has no compelling reason to keep prostitu prostitution criminalized and therefore, but, but I'll, I'll, I'll get into that. First of all, I want to let you also know that um, we've done action research. Uh, I partnered with Brown University. Professor Alina Shin is, uh, has a, a PhD in psychology. She's an assistant profession of um, American Studies and Ethnic Studies at Brown. And we did action research that was IRB approved, and there can't be more credible research than this, on 62 Rhode Island sex workers. And just as um, they were talking about earlier that uh, we talked to all these victims and this is what they tell us. Well, when you do action research on any population, you need to talk to them to find out what they told you. But briefly, I want to talk about um, some of the data from it. We've interviewed 62 cis female sex workers looking to present some of these findings at a Massachusetts labor conference. 77 said that, uh, 77 percent of the, um, them said that they tried to report to the police. The police would not take the report. Four percent were arrested for trying to report to the, the police. 27 percent said they did not report crimes because they don't think the police would do anything. 37, 32 percent said they did not report because they didn't want to draw attention to their co-workers. There's also um, a human justice report done from, um, from six cities, a thousand youths between 13 and 24. 97% of these youths say, we don't have pimps or traffickers or market facilitators. We teach each other. They said 
they cannot access services. So when the woman was describing the runaway girl that was sexually abused by the stepfather, she's jumped into the foster home, she's running away, the system is failing her, um, she becomes vulnerable. I found out in Rhode Island we have 320 unlicensed foster homes. So when they do rescue a child, they dump them back in these, the same situation they ran for. And a runaway teenager becomes kind of like a prostitute that their word's just uncredible. No one wants to believe what they have to say. 12% of foster care kids have been sexually assaulted by their caregivers straight across the nation. So we see this as a pro if we want to keep youth out of the sex trade, which we all want to do, no one wants to see children exploited, we don't want to see women exploited. We need to provide the safety net that they no longer have, and we need to work at policies that will help that. Now I want to talk about drug issues for a minute. I used to be addicted to crack cocaine for 20 years. I've been clean and sober for close to 15 years. I was sent to prison twice in Florida because I was a street-based worker addicted to drugs. So arresting me did not help me, and I could get more drugs inside the prison, and we were also sexually assaulted by correctional officers because, again, who's going to believe us? And part of your recovery, if anyone's knows anything about AA or NA, is you have to take responsibility for your addiction. So me blaming this bad man that gave me heroin really becomes problematic. And it's taken a step further. If a drug dealer says, I'm not giving you dope unless you bring me money, and you break into houses or steal cars, are we going to claim they're all victims too? Where does it stop? So I, I brought packages, um, 21 packages for all of you on the committee. I have letters here from Professor Alina Shin that helped me do the Rhode Island research. I also have a letter from Professor Jolene Rubin Rye from UNH who teaches uh, classes on global sex industry and I presented her class. I presented seven <coughs> universities in New England that have recognized me as an expert on sex work and sex trafficking. I've been a sex worker for over 32 years. I'm 52 years old and while I know in the sex industry, we have a wide variety of people. Some are with uh, drug problems, some have mental health problems, some have domestic violence problems, some are very well empowered. The 62 people we interviewed, 14.52% of them had been to grad school. Only one didn't have a GED or a high school diploma. So when we're trying to paint the same picture of every person, that they're all victims and they're all drug addicts, it's really quite insulting, and it's not based in any, fa um, in, in any reality. I also want the committee to recognize how much bias and stigma was to even have this conversation. Why are we so scared to have this conversation? Why is it that only victims matter? We know 98% of the people in the sex industry are consenting adults. We know that criminalization has failed human trafficking victims. New Hampshire has only arrested not more than, a uh, little more than 500 people for prostitution in over 15 years. They can't police 1% of the sex trade. They have failed, criminalization has failed to protect anyone. Often, sex workers are charged with promoting, handling, just because they work together. If I work alone, it's a misdemeanor, but if I work with another sex worker, we share space, share uh, clients, uh, we become panderers, um, pimps, and we're, and we're talking about major felonies there. So we're creating, all this trafficking stuff has created a situation where sex workers can't tell. It's almost like being an illegal immigrant. Your status as a person is criminalized. It was like being gay was 30 years ago. Just being gay made you a criminal. Um, I also have letters from Desiree Alliance. Um, the director of Desiree Alliance has a master's degree in social justice. Desiree Alliance is a, um, has a, a biannual conference with over 300 sex workers and academics uh, globally that meet. I have attended two of their conferences. We have a joint statement that was written by Desiree Alliance. It is signed by 132 organizations uh, in the United States supporting uh, decriminalization. I also have a letter from um, um, the director of SWAN in Colorado, who also has a PhD, is on the Human Trafficking Task Force. I also have a letter from um, SWAT Behind Bars. So SWAT stands for Sex Worker Outreach Project. And in the last year we launched SWAT, um, SWAT Behind Bars. We send out a newsletter to over 1,000 incarcerated sex workers. We offer them 
uh, or correspondence classes while they're in prisons because the prison system's not doing that. Pen pals, we're trying to reconnect them with services upon their release so they have community. We find sex workers are pushed to the margins of society. They're not welcome in their communities. They're not able to access social services. When you involve law enforcement, you lose trust with this population. Um, there should not be any magical gatekeepers of, of services. What we have found is there are no services. There is no subsidized housing. There are no jobs that pay a living wage. There's not a higher education without that. What they do to the victims is they dump them in public shelters and they abandon them to live in extreme poverty. Now, if you're a homeless person or someone with drug issues, I understand that might be a step up. But my experience in 2008 New Jersey, I had a New Jersey SWAT team kick in the door of my home because I had an escort ad. I was in my mid-40s. They were waving guns around, and it was a quality of life investigation. And this, this all happened over a misdemeanor. I did 90 days in jail. I was made to pay a $3,720 fine, even though I told the judge that I was unemployed and a single mother. So he knew I had to go do more sex work to, to pay that fine, and I was therefore trafficked by the state of New Jersey. So anytime you take a sex worker, you give her fines, you put her on probation, you think we need to be rehabilitated, and you remove any sense of agency we have um, as if we don't count and, we, and you want us all to be victims. And even when they say they don't arrest the victim, or, or they're gonna let them go, once you're arrested, your name's in the paper, you're at a criminal record, you've been traumatized by the arrest. Police officers are allowed to have sexual contact with people before they arrest them. We've documented this all over the country. This is not okay. It's actually uh, state-sponsored rape. Um, I also have letters from Norma Jean Almadava, who was an LAPD police officer for 10 years. Norma Jean is our statistician, and I'm going to donate this book to the committee. This book has every prostitution and disorderly conduct the rest of 30 years for the whole country. And it also has them separated by gender. So you can see that they're arresting uh, 80 to 90 percent of women and 10 percent of the men. Now, and when we talk about criminalizing clients, because the word John is very derogatory, We've seen the Nordic model in Sweden where they criminalize the clients. The sex workers do not trust the police. The, the police officers are hanging out in front of their houses trying to get the clients as they come. Um, it has not lowered uh, the rate of prostitution. Um, we also have a letter from Swap Outreach um, Project. They have 30 chapters in the United States. I have a letter from so, uh, a sex trafficking victim in Philadelphia that was sex trafficked as a child, and she can't find one trafficking NGO that will provide her any valid service because she's not the right kind of victim. I also have, uh, because it's Human Trafficking Awareness Month, um, Beyond Slavery has done a camp uh, online campaign. Uh, there are researchers, academics globally, um, that talk about, you know, we're pumping over $600 million a year into the trafficking hysteria and who does it really help? Once in a while we find a victim, I'm not saying that, I'm not denying victims occur, but how easy is it for someone to threaten me when I can't tell? It's almost like, again, being an illegal immigrant, you, can take, you don't even have to take my passport, you just say, I'm going to tell if you don't do what I want. So when women can't come forward and tell you that they're being abused, that they're being controlled, um, it sets the stage to allow that to happen. Criminalization is what is causing trafficking. And for a moment, I'd like to talk about New Zealand. I'm going to loan this book to the committee. This, was, this book was written by the legislatures in New Zealand. New Zealand didn't just decide to decriminalize. They brought healthcare professionals, sex workers, police departments, social workers to the table. And they studied the issue for years. And when they did get criminalized, they had a study that would go on for five years so they could measure the effect of de decriminalization. Did things get worse or better? And what they found is decriminalization just about rid the sex industry of exploitation. They have not had one sex trafficking case since 2009. Sex workers report having better relationships with law enforcement. Um, and there seems to be a problem with, I have to arrest you to convince you that I'm a victim. 
Because I'm pretty sure if you're a victim of domestic violence or rape, you know you're a victim. And what if they created a law that says we're going to force women who are beaten by their husbands to prosecute their husbands? We're going to arrest them to save them from that domestic violence. More women are being beaten by their husbands than they are trafficked into prostitution. So I see the fact that we don't want to have these conversations is really problematic. And Amnesty International says sex workers need to be a part of this conversation, a part of these policies, because they directly affect our lives. Now, the 30 years worth of um, arrests show us that only 1.8% of those cases involved the minors. So this is, the, the, the DOJ and the FBI has not brought through any credible evidence that there's a sex trafficking epidemic we have a new name for an old problem. The old problem was runaway children, and the new name is sex trafficking. These same kids were out 30 years ago doing the same thing, but we have a new name for it. Um, this is a pipeline to prison. Kids in foster care are more likely to go on to prison. In Rhode Island, when they age out of the system at 18, they're literally thrown out into the streets with no resources. And let's for, let's for a minute talk about a 16 and 17 year old it's not even going to call them sex, uh, sex workers. They're people engaged in survival sex because they're minors. We don't want to see, no minors should have to do this. So they, they, they've told us that they teach each other how to find clients while avoiding the social workers and police. So they're both legally trafficking victims. When one of them turns 18, they become the trafficker. And then go to prison for 10 or 15 years, and it might be the 16-year-old that talked to them. But more importantly, I want to tell you about an ongoing case right now in California of Chelsea Gap. Chelsea Gap was a runaway. She was most likely incorrigible. She was 17 years old. And she was running away from a violent pimp and she went up to a police cruiser. And rather than help her, the officer had sex with her. And so did two other officers before she turned 18. When she turned 18, they passed through a round of 30 police officers in seven departments. Then Richmond police access victims' compensation, and they flew her all the way to Florida to a rehab. They tried to inject her with something at the rehab. She tried to bite the rehab worker. They threw her in jail with a $300,000 bond for felony assault. Prosecutor O'Malley, within hours, told the media she couldn't prosecute the police because she didn't have a victim. And there was not one trafficking NGO in this country that wanted to help Chelsea, but the sex workers did. We rallied around, we raised the money, we got an attorney, we got her out of that jail within 10 days back in California where she can hold those officers accountable for exploiting her. And I, I, know, I, I have no way saying all police officers are bad, but when you set up a system that women can't tell them they're vulnerable, we've had other cases where an officer picked up a 17-year-old, because first of all, we don't know if they're, what age they are when they're doing prostitution things, and she says, you know, he let me fondle him for five minutes in the car, and then he pulled out his badge and he arrested me. And if he's a police officer and I'm 17, isn't that not supposed to happen? So let me ask you why it is law enforcement are allowed to engage in any sexual contact with anyone if they think there's even an extreme possibility that we might be a victim. And even if we are a prostitute, what gives them the right to gain sex through fraud, because lying in vice is obviously fraud and coercion, and it actually is a form of sex trafficking. We find these, a lot of these rescues have traumatized the victims a lot more. No one's following through six months later to see how that victim is faring. Did the services we provided help them? They're being dumped into the shelters. Um, but I want to shut up for a minute. I did bring packages to hand out to the committee, but I want to be able to answer any questions. And another reason, the last thing I'll say is the reason that we think that this is important is because I understand the committee has a lot of questions. There's so much bad information. I understand there's a lot of valid concerns. And, it, and this isn't something we should take lightly. And I can bring all the experts you need to the table at your committee hearings, provide you with tons of sex workers, trafficking victims, academics that have studied this for years and years. And I hope that will help the committee. Any questions? Everybody is done. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
I don't know if that's good or bad, but uh, <laughs> is it okay if I hand these packets out now that I'm done? Thank you. Thank you so much for your time and for listening to me. I'm just wondering, Mr. Chairman, is this the right to work bill? <laughs> uh, they included is what you're saying. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I appreciate your testimony. I think I remember you from a lot. Yes, I, I don't go away. <laughs> <laughs> I take my job pretty seriously. The chair will call uh, Detective Burnett. Hello again. Thank you very much again for giving me the opportunity to address you. I also wanted to, to thank everybody for the time that they spend looking into the issues that impact New Hampshire citizens. Um, one of the reasons why I was asked to come and speak to you is because my tendency is to keep it real and that's what I'm going to do here. What I'm concerned about, if we want to talk about a study, this is the second year that legislation of this ilk has been brought forward to the committee. Two of the cases that Pat Conway spoke about, I initiated the operations on both of those. I have the first conviction in the state of New Hampshire regarding adult victims of human trafficking, and I set up the sting operation involving the case involving the minor. I am one of many individuals who have been working very closely together for years to get these bills passed for human trafficking legislation, working with victim advocates, um, working with federal partners that we work with very closely in the state of New Hampshire. And I want to say New Hampshire, not Los Angeles, not Hartford, not New Zealand, not Australia, New Hampshire. If anybody who sponsored this bill had any, let me, let me back this up. If anybody who sponsored this bill truly wanted to educate themselves on what we are seeing in New Hampshire and New Hampshire law enforcement, not one of those sponsors has ever called myself or Lieutenant Ledoux. She and I actually met as a result of training on this case. If anybody wanted education on any of this, I have a presentation that I present to a multidisciplinary group of professionals in New Hampshire regarding human trafficking and victimology and predatory behavior. We have spent years as a multidisciplinary group of professionals studying this issue, but not in Australia, not in Sweden, not in Los Angeles, in New Hampshire. New Hampshire has a very unique set of circumstances. We're seeing a lot of influx coming up. A couple bits of clarification. Prostitution is a B misdemeanor. A B misdemeanor. So anybody who comes in and tells you that we have all these women incarcerated for prostitution has no idea what we're dealing with in New Hampshire they're probably not from New Hampshire or they haven't looked into it. You cannot send a person convicted of a B misdemeanor to jail. They don't go to jail. It's essentially a slap on the wrist. Have I ever run into a sex worker in 20, nearly you know, 23 years of doing this line of work that was in it voluntarily? No, I have not. In 2015, I had three sex workers, if you will, make independent reports to the Portsmouth Police Department of rape and I pulled out the stops, and I tied every single one of those cases into the same serial rapist. We take this seriously in this state. We work with advocates. We work with the U.S. Attorney's Office. I have DEA, the Marshals, and the resident agent in charge of Homeland Security on speed dial. I could text him right now, and in the middle of my testimony, he'd probably get right back to me. We are a small state with a bunch of people that had to learn from each other. We're not experts in this. We learned. We learned by 
teaching each other. If I have a question, I pick up the phone and call Nicole. I, I don't have to call Lieutenant Ledoux unless I'm actually in the, in the building. I call Mike Kusanka over at Homeland Security. Every single time I needed services for a victim, they're right there for me. We don't just dump them in shelters in this state. We just don't say, hey, go dump yourself in rehab. I handhold every single victim because I don't want to lose them in the system. We go out of our way in this state because the legislature has allowed us to do that. You've given us the means to do what we do. And because we're small, and because we don't see a lot of these cases, well, we're seeing more and more now that we're more aware, we're teaching each other, and we're teaching other groups of individuals, nurses, medical professionals, psychiatrists, drug addiction um, facilities, advocates, judges, we got to educate, Pat Conway and I got to educate a judge who, who was amazing. Amazing. But I got it immediately. And, and there's something to be said about that. We are not other places with regard to victimology. And I need for that to be impressed upon you. If people really truly wanted to study this issue about decriminalizing prostitution, why haven't any of us gotten a phone call? My case was cited in a couple of the articles that have been mentioned on this bill. I haven't gotten a phone call from any of these individuals. We don't have to agree, but educate yourself. Come in here and make an educated bill, sponsored educated bill. If you look at Nevada, brothels are legal, but it's regulated. We can't regulate our Medicaid system in New Hampshire. We want to keep it real. I had a human trafficking victim from another state that ended up in New Hampshire, and she got Medicaid and all sorts of services, and the EBT card using a fake social security number and a fake name, and ended up in Portsmouth Regional Hospital with 28 days of treatment that, guess what, you and I all paid for. But nobody was watching the store. We have a lot of things that need to be studied. The conversation that should be happening doesn't need to start in this group. It needs to happen with those of us in the trenches who are talking to each other all the time. Representative Panalakis, who always steps out before I talk, and I don't know why, She's called me before. I called her when I go, hey, Representative, what are you doing? And we have really good conversations. You call, pick up the phone, call. Come make an appointment. You want to see the Florimond case? I'll show you the Florimond case. You can see every piece of it. You want to see my presentation? I'll give you the presentation. No problem doing that. But the conversation, we've all been having this conversation. The coalition, the advocate groups, we've all been having this conversation for years. Where y'all been? The law is fantastic. We have a fantastic human trafficking law that a lot of people fought to get through. But let's not take a step backwards. If we're going to have a conversation, then let's have it informally over coffee, like all of us regularly do. If I want to call Nicole or Sergeant Manson here at 2 o'clock in the morning because I have a question, I'm going to do it. We're not territorial in this state. We need each other. And I don't care who you are, whether you're representative or whether you're a resident agent in charge of the FBI, I pick up the phone and call you. We work very closely with Boston because they're the closest to us. We share some defendants in these cases in terms of the trafficking. But I wanted to, a couple things were mentioned, uh, the, the whole Sweden thing. I'm going to give you some quotes with regard to Sweden and their legalization. This comes from former Deputy Prime Minister of Sweden, Margareta Weinberg. She's posed, I believe that we will never succeed in combating trafficking in women if we do not simultaneously work to abolish prostitution and the sexual exploitation of many women and children particularly in light of the fact that many women in prostitution in countries that have legalized prostitution are originally victims of human trafficking. Europe had a 12% mortality rate increase in legalized sex workers in England. Another little tidbit from Sweden. Um, <coughs> opposed. Some prostitution defenders argue that prostitution is an acceptable solution to poverty. What they mean, but do not say, is that prostitution is an acceptable solution for women living in poverty. Seldom do we see proposals that poor men should make their way out of poverty by welcoming the insertion of penises and other objects into them on a regular basis, or dance naked on a stage in front of ogling and masturbating males. The prostitution industry exploits to its advantage the fact that most women and children who are in prostitution come from the most oppressed and vulnerable groups in society. What I do want to leave you with because I could do this all day. And I know you don't want to be doing that. Or maybe you do. Depends, I suppose, for the entertainment.
I want to read something to you. And keep it real. This is one of the many victims that I've worked with. She was trafficking victims. These aren't my words. These are her words. And I have permission to share them with you. I just want everyone to know that this case has significantly left my life and most days feeling defeated. I've always tried to carry myself as a woman of dignity and self-respect. Well, as a direct result from this, I started using to shut my mind off. I felt like I had never been able to forgive myself and that it would be almost impossible to resume my life prior to this. I turned my back to anyone that cared about me in fear that I would be judged. Then once it came time to going back to my kids, I couldn't, and again, that was feeling so ashamed of what happened, and truthfully, I needed to numb myself, which later on resulted in an overdose. I don't want anybody to think that I'm not in some way responsible because I do know right from wrong. What I didn't realize was being manipulated and used during a weak time in my life. A part of who I was before this has taken a piece of my own values and how I've tried to present who I am. I am hopeful that the other women going through this can still find a way out and to take a stand back for their lives. No one deserves to be torn down and used only for the selfish desires of somebody else while targeting women who are already in distress. My hopes for the outcome of this to be handled with the effect it's left on me and others involved. So thank you for letting me speak and I hope the defendant will take the time to think of the hurt you've caused. Any questions? Yes. Mr. The chairman will answer that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Your question, your, you provided very compelling arguments to learn more about it, like what a study committee would do. My question to you is that, is there anyone else other than victims, though? Your entire testimony is all about victims. Yeah, I don't know if I'm understanding exactly what you're asking me. Well, yeah. well thank you, Mr. Chairman. All you've talked about is victims. Because in my 22 now, year now career. And, if I may finish. Mm -hmm. All you talked about is victims. Mm -hmm. What about everybody else? We mean everybody else. Who, is there no one else involved in, in the study committee here? The study is not to study victims of, of uh, sexual abuse. It's a study to look at decriminalization. They've talked all about victims. What about everybody else? Should we have, should we learn anything about everything else? What I'm saying is I'm absolutely adamantly opposed to a study wasting taxpayer time and legislative initiative to, to decriminalize when we could exactly be doing what Lieutenant Ledoux had suggested and give us resources. We're doing this. We're, we're learning ways to deal with this. We are looking at different ways. We, I don't go out and go, let's do a sting operation for prostitution for ha-has. It doesn't happen that way. We don't really nearly go out and rest for prostitution. It is a means to an end for us. But we, the conversation needs should be coming to us, those of us who are doing this every single day. And that's my, my issue. <coughs> because we're seeing, we're not only seeing victims, but again, in my career, the cases that I have come across and that I've done, have resulted in always drugs, always. Every sting operation I've ever done has ended up with drugs on the table because that is a huge issue in terms of the, the it, in this area, again, New Hampshire, and you can grin all you want, but in New Hampshire, this is what we're seeing. Addicted women, young women with children. Again, that's what we're seeing. And I have no issue with studying things, but let's take it back and actually Talk to those of us who are involved before you start sponsoring bills and, and having us come up here and talk about things that we probably could have hammered out and presented a better legislative initiative to give us the services that we need to deal with the issues that we're seeing more and more every day on my desk. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for your testimony. At the beginning of your testimony, you kept saying how we could call you or the other young lady over here um, to get educated. Mm -hmm. Yet it seems like law enforcement doesn't want to educate, allow the representatives to educate themselves other than what you feel is the system of prostitution. And what my question is, is what harm is it if we have this study committee and have both of you come up and educate us in your side, but then also have this lady from Rhode Island come with her friends and educate us on the other side of the, you know, the not victims side. What is wrong with that? Because it just seems like law enforcement doesn't want us to be educated. 
And I, and I apologize, that, that's what it appears to be intended because that's not the intent at all. Um, I think it's, it's difficult, and I listened to testimony yesterday, when we have people from other areas that we can't compare apples and oranges, we are in New Hampshire. Um, we've been, I think the frustration is we've all been at the table for so long, working on these issues and, and looking at the pros and cons and, de and determining how we go about dealing with this issue. And the next thing you know, bills are being, being sponsored and nobody's ever calling, and it's not just me, not just Lieutenant Ledoux or, or Sergeant Mann, but I could give you a laundry list of individuals who can look at it from a different angle. Um, and I guess, I, before we start doing formal stuff, if it's something that somebody feels really passionately about, your, your co-sponsor did it because somebody asked her to. Is that educated legislation? Find out the background, and then decide if it's a need, and then move forward. Um, I have, like I said, I have a number of conversations with Representative Kanellakis on a number of issues, and we don't always agree. But give yourself that background so that you can kind of weigh things out and decide. Um, I have to base things on what we see. We're in the trenches. We're the ones doing this all the time. And we have a really, really small community in New Hampshire because of our population. We're seeing the same issues as bigger places. But we always, we have those conversations going on right now. We're, on, we're in contact constantly, and it's almost like there's a disconnect um, in terms of our local representation in the House and the, and the Senate. Um, it's been a long time since I can remember getting a phone call other than Representative Panalakis about something that we're, Portsmouth is on the forefront of, and, and I can't speak to Manchester um, or Nashua or Salem, but we're not just representing law enforcement, but we, we work very close with advocacy and, and all of our, um, the coalition and our domestic violence um, shelters and, and medical professionals. We, we are all involved, engaged in this all the time. I think maybe that's just the frustration for me coming out is that all of a sudden it's like this big, big issue that we gotta do a study on and yet we've all been doing it for so long and nobody's ever come and asked us about anything. And I can give you people that will give you opinions that are completely opposed to mine. And that's okay, because that makes the better product at the end. Um, but to come in and say, we're gonna study decriminalization, why don't we study if we have a problem first? Why don't we find out if there's a problem first before we go ahead and put resources into that? Because again, we have a couple of issues in New Hampshire that really need a lot of attention. It had nothing to do with what I do. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. Uh, just a real small follow up, Mr. <laughs> Chair. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, what we need to do is. But, it, you know, to pertain into the taxpayers, mm -hmm. um, study committees are almost virtually zero money. You know, for me, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not getting paid to be here. And I realize that. Yeah. Uh, and I'm going to be sitting on this study mm -hmm. committee possible. But I just, I come back to, I don't understand why law enforcement doesn't want us to be educated on the other side from other people. You know, in, in, in bottom line, you know, we're lawmakers. We don't have to get permission. There's a separation mm -hmm. between us. We don't have to get permission or even call you when we want to put legislation in. No, you don't. Um, you know, but to educate us, I want you here to educate us, but I also want them here to educate us on both sides. So, I, you know, I, don't I still don't understand why. I, I, I'm not opposed to that. But let's find people who in New Hampshire who represent what's going on in New Hampshire. Can you can I, you find I, I think you, she will. I think that's what that's right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um quick question, and this may not be the time or the place, but as a legislature, what what do you need? What can we help you with? You know, maybe you can write stuff down or we can talk, you know, a few of us. What can we do to make it better? What can we do to help? I mean, you say, like, we're a disconnect. Yeah, this is my first year. I haven't mm -hmm. been here very long. But obviously, we don't know what you need because we haven't spoken to you. So I think we're both sides are in the dark it's, in some respect. So maybe we could figure that out and then see what we should do with the study. We'd love to. We'd love to. I need a business card. To write things on sticky notes, so I'll, I'll write it on a piece of paper and hand it to you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time.
Did you bring us pizza? No, I didn't. <laughs> no food or drink in this room. That's right. You want me to be there. All right, the chair calls Corey Schmidt. members of the committee. Uh, my name is Corey Smith. Um, I live in Concord, New Hampshire. Um, I've worked on human trafficking for the last 10 years at the national level, also the state and local level, and the international level. Um, I, first of all, I, I just want to say that I do think the idea of this study is a very good one. My experience over the last 10 years is that despite a lot of awareness and attention uh, and huge support and bipartisan support and fantastic work here in New Hampshire on the state level with legislation. And I think, what, three years ago, unanimously passed, which was fantastic. Um, and I know also I should say that there is a collaborative uh, of a lot of people in this room that have been working on human trafficking uh, for years and continue to do so. And my belief in looking at the language of uh, the statute and study is that my assumption was a lot of those people, either formally or informally, will be involved in any such study if it happens. Um, the other thing I would say, too, is when I looked at the language of the study, um, I read it as positive and negative results of criminalizing sex work and also of decriminalizing selling sex. Um, I know that the, the title is Establishing a Committee to Study Decriminalizing Sex Work, but I do think the exercise itself is really important to look at the pros and cons and to go where the facts are and to find the information. Um, the other thing I would say is after working a long time on this, the one thing there's a desperate need for um, is facts and stats on human trafficking. Human trafficking happens in the shadows. It's underground. Uh, it's a criminal industry that's one of the largest in the world. Depending on what uh, results you see after arms trafficking and the drug trade, um, the information, because it is underground, because it deals with vulnerable populations, whether immigrants without status, runaway and homeless youth, is very hard to come by. Um, in my work on this, I worked for a private foundation that was started by the founders of eBay that funded work, invested in trafficking organizations that both did policy and services work. One of the initiatives that we did was to fund a prevalence estimate to examine how prevalent uh, trafficking was in the United States. And by that I mean all forms of human trafficking. Uh, what we did is we commissioned Northeastern University in Boston. Uh, what they found was that study was unworkable. The reason being is that they tried to compile all the existing research and there were so many holes that they could not uh, put a workable study. I mention this because I think any effort, and, and not that you're doing a prevalence estimate, but I think any effort to find facts and empirical evidence in examining the issue are critical. And I've seen some of the best work done on the state level. For example, Ohio has one of the best uh, studies they've done on human trafficking in any state uh, and far superior uh, to work done on the federal level. So I just wanted to mention that because my, the way I looked at this was a, a, a possibly a really positive exercise, you know, a neutral, detached study that was open and looked into the issue and involved all the stakeholders uh, that you would either work with formally or I'm sure informally to call upon law enforcement victim services. Um, the, the, the other thing that I would just say, because um, I know we've been here a long time, so I will keep it short, but I do think, too, the criminalization of women that are being trafficked is a huge issue. I think that would be a really important part. Um, New Hampshire did pass uh, an ability for uh, women to petition to have convictions vacated. I think that's critical. I work with survivors whose lives are completely upended for decades after they were uh, convicted of prostitution offenses uh, when they're young. I'm not saying that is the trend currently, and I know that law enforcement uh, has made huge changes in how uh, prostitutes are viewed as, as victims of human trafficking, and I've seen that over and over again. Places, some places in the country, I think still some uh, learning and education, but overall a huge sea change in looking at victims as victims, which I think is critical. But I do think that the more that you can get at the issue to decriminalize victimhood, the better, because they can't get jobs, they can't buy houses, they can't do those things that help repair and make their lives whole 
I work with a survivor in Phoenix, Arizona that dedicates her life to helping victims of trafficking. She still lives hand to mouth because they don't have a law in the books that vacates. We do, and that's fantastic, and I think was informed by a lot of the experiences, but um, I just wanted to mention that. And then the only other thing I would say um, is I think in, in any study, too, thinking about victim services is critical in survivor aftercare. What I found on the, the national level is that many, many, many states have passed very good laws uh, that give new authorities for prosecutors and law enforcement, as they should, but too often there's, there's no money for victims or survivors. Um, I know that's a tough issue in New Hampshire over here, but I think it's important if you really care about trafficking, we have to take care of the victims and help the survivors. And then the last thing I would say, too, is that if this does end up getting amended or, or altered in any way, um, I would also encourage you to look at the issue of demand that was mentioned. I think demand is important with men that purchase sex because it is overwhelmingly men. Um, there's been some really interesting studies that show how effective prevention could be with education of men on purchasing of sex. Men, usually 18 to 24, when they purchase sex, they do it at that age. They usually do it in a group of other men, and there's usually the influence of drug and alcohol. Um, if you can get at those behaviors, I think there could be a huge amount of good done through education and prevention for young men. So I do think demand, when you think about decriminalization uh, or criminalization, that that should also be part of the picture. So with that, um, I'll just turn over a minute. Good question. Oh. Uh, Jim, sure, question. Two. Um, was it Northeastern or Northwestern? Northeastern. Question. Was that they had troubles with a trying to compile a meta-study, and that's where the holes were? Yeah, because all the underlying studies have serious issues with the quality of data. Um, and, you know, you can go right now and Google human trafficking, say, on a global scale. You'll find 13 million, 15 million, 27 million, 35, and I've even seen now 48 million. Um, that doesn't do anyone any good, and what I think is best for New Hampshire, obviously, determine the nature and the scope of the problem with this particular focus and go where the facts are. You know, they say facts are stubborn things. I love that phrase. But I think that's really important is to find uh, the scope. And that was mentioned earlier, too, um, I think by the previous uh, witness about, you know, what is the nature of the problem? Because I also think that's important. This, obviously, I think we get at a solution of some type, but what is the nature of the problem before you do the solution? The chair appreciates you keeping the subject matter to the study committee, which is what this bill is. If I were chairing in another committee afterwards, I would keep that subject added to the study issue and not to the issue of the study that the commission would study. And that's something we always did in Ways and Means. So I would appreciate you know, keeping it to the subject of the uh, proceed. Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, just very briefly, Amanda Brady Sexton with the Coalition Against Domestic and Sexual Violence. Our 13 member programs provide services to human trafficking victims. Um, in the state of New Hampshire. And I would just offer to the committee that if you were looking to do a study, I would be very happy to work with uh, committee members as well as the sponsors of the bill to rewrite this and put this in a form of a commission and ensure that all of the appropriate um, stakeholders are represented on the commission, including um, the people who represent um, sex, sex workers industry. And I think that um, that would be something that would be uh, beneficial. Um, I don't think that this is uh, the, the way that we are going to get um, the best results out of um, a study. I think that in addition it would be helpful to um, to look at the directive and to um, narrow it to um, looking at human trafficking and, um, and prostitution. And in addition, um, I would just say that one of the things that I think is absolutely critical, and thank you Representative McNally for asking the question, um, is uh, to um, ensure that one of the directives is to look at the fact that the state of New Hampshire um, does not appropriate any money to um, general fund service, general fund dollars to victims of sexual assaults um, or victims of human trafficking. So I think that um, representative, the question um, was a, a great one and I think the answer is that we really need to study ways that we can find funding for services for, for victims um, of crime. Now the chairman's indicated to me that there would probably be an ad hoc committee uh, on this, a subcommittee for that too, and of course we have to use, use your input for it and anyone involved too as well. Thank you. Questions of the committee? Good. I just, um, thank you for referencing what I think are some of the collateral um, damage that gets done from this kind of prostitution laws that we have. 
Uh, I had a question about PREA, which I think you're familiar with. Statistically, um, in PREA, either in the state or nationally, is there a, a greater preponderance of people who have been convicted of prostitution uh, are they more likely to be raped in prison than somebody else? I think I'm, 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 the Prison Rape Elimination Act? Yeah, oh, sorry. Yeah, prison yeah I don't, I, I know of that, but I don't know statistics okay. that well. Uh, yeah, we can certainly get you the answer, Representative. Can represent, these are things I would assume the study committee would be, would be interested in. Uh, and that, that kind of, you know, the stigma associated with people who have been, you know, what does it mean when you had a prostitution conviction? How does that trail you the rest of the life? And I know we did, we took care of it with some of the human trafficking, the, the, per se, two years ago, we eliminated it, but we still. Mr. Chairman? Question? Yeah. Uh, so your group would be willing to sit down with the study committee, unlike, you know, the police want to keep us ignorant. Well, but you know, um, you don't want no. to educate us, us yeah. in what you feel would be right. Well, I can speak to um, the second part of that question, and um, what we would be very happy to do, and what we would encourage um, um, you all to look at is uh, having a commission with everybody at the table versus a study committee driven by the legislature. Um, we found that to be very effective when we first put the commission in place. That was the genesis of the first human trafficking law. Um, as well as a commission um, that looked at uh, the rewrites of our, our human trafficking laws. We think that that's a very effective approach. And, just one more. and would the opposition, you know, the people that would like to see uh, legalized prostitution, would they be invited to that table? Yes, I mentioned that prior, and I'm sorry if I was not clear, Representative okay. Burke. I think that um, that I, I personally, uh, in the coalition, would be happy to you know um, to reach out and to make sure that it is a well-rounded commission, if that would be the pleasure of the committee. Thank you. you know, I think um, the stakeholders here in this room, and I found this an extremely helpful conversation here in the different perspectives, and I mean that. And I think that one of the things I really um, appreciate about working on human trafficking which often doesn't happen on other issues I've worked on that are very polarizing, like immigration, uh, is that we, we, in my work with um, NGOs, have worked very closely with law enforcement, and I find them an invaluable partner. Um, when I was at the foundation, my colleague was a retired police chief that had worked on trafficking. As I said before, it was cool before it became a big issue. Um, and so I do hope, you know, I think that everyone in this room, uh, the experience, and I know there's a lot of strong experience and passion that informs that experience, but I think that would be essential to make this this commission on this study. Thank you. The chair had a question. You had a, uh, I'll ask the same question of you. Are you aware of any other study that was done in the commission that were worked with uh, the uh, commission to pick up on? Has there been a study committee of this nature before? Uh, uh, relative aware? to the decriminalization of prostitution? Yes. Um, no, um, the Human Trafficking um, Task Force um, definitely addresses these <coughs> issues. Um, as they uh, pertain to um, human trafficking. Um, but I, I'm not aware of any task force specifically um, looking at the directive of looking at the decriminalization or legalization of prostitution. Um, I've been doing this for 16 years, or I, there's not been any formal study. I was relying on your experience. I yeah. Your experience there. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Paul. Yes. Um, I'm under the impression you think this is a commission. I think it should be, I'm sorry, Representative, I do think it should be a commission, be not a, a study commission. committee. Not a study committee. Yeah. Okay. So I think, and for people who might be new, the difference between a commission and a study committee is that a commission is um, made up of appointed representatives from um, specific organizations um, or specific interests. So all of the stakeholders sit around the table and work together versus um, five representatives and, and Senate representatives. Um, well, this bill calls for three representatives. Yeah. Three of the Senate. Yeah. Made up yeah. Yeah. Totally calls for. yeah. And you know, certainly um, that's that can be effective and you can sort of have an agenda that calls upon specific agencies. But I think having that conversation and having everyone at the table at the same time has really been um, beneficial uh, to this work. Second question. I'm oh, sorry. What was the question following? Has anybody um, found out what the interest of either the speaker or the governor are in talking and having commissions? I have not, Representative. Um, but you know, I will say that um, we have. 
I was absolutely floored, and I know many of you were too, when we had a unanimous roll call vote on House Bill 317 uh, a couple of years ago. We had a unanimous roll call vote on, in the Senate and the House. There is a tremendous amount of support for people looking at the issue of human trafficking and sex crimes, uh, which we are so grateful for. And so I do think that even if um, there were uh, and uh, if there were some opposition to the idea of commissions, I think that we could find a way to make it an exception. So Thank you. I'm confident of it. <laughs> I, I, I do have to, unfortunately, I have to leave, but I did want to say as I volunteered to represent Murray, I, I, uh, and I say to the chair that should the chair decide to set up a subcommittee, I wouldn't be willing to serve on it, and I really like the concept of a commission would work to help draft something. Okay, I'll make note of that, Representative Christian. <laughs> Further questions of the committee? Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. Chair will call uh, Laurel Weisses from Manchester in support of the bill. Thank you for letting me speak today. This is my first time in front of this sort of committee. Um, my name is Laurel Weisses. I live in Ward 4 in Manchester. I'm a constituent of Elizabeth Edwards. Um, Could you repeat your last sentence? I'm a constituent of Elizabeth Edwards. I live in Ward 4 in Manchester. Um, I'm here today as a layperson. I'm here today as someone who has been involved in the adult entertainment industry, with which there is a lot of overlap with sex work and prostitution. Um, I've worked in the industry since 2008, and in that entire time, there was no compulsion for me to stay in that industry. I got offered drugs almost every day of the week and never took them. Um, apart from that, as I, I still perform, um, apart from that, I also hold professional license as an aesthetics instructor, um, doing skincare, um, chemical peels, makeup, what have you. Um, I have been licensed as a security guard before. Um, and the thing that I think most people are missing is that well yes there are a drastic number of victims in the adult entertainment and the uh, sex work uh, industries some people actually do enjoy their work and the difference between selling your labor as like hard labor construction or performing sexual favors for money consensually is like the line is so thin. Um, I want to be able to create spaces where people who enjoy their work uh, can do so safely, but I cannot under current regulations. And I think the overarching thing that I've been hearing so far is deciding that a lot of these women are victims, a lot of them are. I will give you that. I have known quite a few um, adult entertainers. Uh, especially in larger populations, uh, who have been victims, but deciding that they are victims, even when they adamantly claim that they are not, um, removes any notion of individual autonomy and is completely anti-freedom, in my opinion. And that's all I have. Questions of the committee? So, no, thank you. Chair will call Ian Freeman. Uh, good afternoon at this point. Appreciate y'all uh, listening. I'm Ian Freeman and I'm Ian Keen. Um, we are just talking about a study committee here, right? Because yes. if you pay attention to what the police have been saying, it sounds like they think we're talking about actually decriminalizing human trafficking. And I think it's important to point out that the study committee is going to be looking at decriminalizing prostitution which is my understanding, we're looking at the issue of humans who are adults consenting with one another to trade uh, sex for money, which is completely different from human trafficking, which I think we all know is enslaving other human beings and clearly should stay uh, a crime. So I just want to make sure we're clear on exactly what it is that's, uh, that's going on here. And yes, as one of the uh, police mentioned earlier, we are in New Hampshire, and New Hampshire is a very special place, but Prohibition doesn't work any differently in New Hampshire than it does around the rest of the world. And so 
Um, one of the things that was pointed out was that uh, the police would say, would tell you that every prostitute they've ever encountered was some sort of victim of human trafficking or uh, a drug addict forced into prostitution by a pimp. And I think it's important to point out to that um, that ultimately these street prostitutes who are likely who they're picking up are far more likely to be those things. Um, if you go and you were to actually have a decriminalized environment, you would likely see more prostitutes operating not on the street, but from the safety of their home or from an office or from some sort of place where there can actually be security and things like that. So of course you're going to see people who are addicted to drugs and people who are being abused being brought into prostitution. It's just the nature of prohibition. And the people who are enforcing this prohibition, these very police, are actually the ones who are, to some extent, responsible, in addition to the legislature for criminalizing consensual acts, uh, they're responsible for driving these acts underground. And when you put something underground, whether it's drugs or whether it's sex, you're going to find some very dangerous people are getting involved in it. And uh, I look forward to uh, something being formed here to where people on all sides of this issue can actually be heard. And I think that's really all I have to say about that. Thanks. Thank you for your testimony. Questions of the committee? Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak on House Bill 287? Seeing none, we'll close the hearing on House Bill 287. And let's see, we can take up House Bill 94. We'd like to invite you to visit freekeen.com. Freekeen.com features audio, video, and blogs chronicling the transition to a voluntary society. Freekeen.com also has comments and discussion forums so you can be heard. Freekeen.com. I should be in Keene, New Hampshire with the Free Staters.